sent him that before. Tony Blair was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom from 1997 to 2007. Among his many international roles today, he is the Quartet Representative in the Middle East, working with the UN, the US, Russia and the EU to try to secure a lasting peace in the region. After leaving politics, Mr. Blair converted to Catholicism and he launched the Tony Blair Faith Foundation, a global initiative to promote respect and understanding among the world's major religions. Many of us in this room have read his recent best-selling memoir, A Journey, My Political Life. Christopher Hitchens is a British-born American author, journalist, and atheist. His regular Vanity Fair column, his prolific speeches and essays are central reading for anyone and everyone concerned about global affairs. Christopher has a number of best-selling books too. Obviously, God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything, and his recently published memoir, Hitch 22. Christopher was recently diagnosed with esophageal cancer and as such, we are doubly grateful that he and his family have joined us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, your debaters. Before getting our debate underway, let me just briefly run down how the next hour and a half will unfold. Each debater has been given seven minutes for their opening remarks for and against the motion. Next, Mr. Hitchens and Mr. Blair will confront each other, head on, so to speak, through two rounds of formal rebuttals. We'll then bring you, the audience, into this debate through written questions. All of you received a written question card at any time in the debate. Fill that out. Pass it down the aisle for collection. I'll also be taking some questions from audience members on the stage, some of the younger audience members here. Those questions will be asked directly to Mr. Blair and Mr. Hitchens. We'll also be bringing in our online audience through a series of questions too. The debate will conclude with short five-minute closing statements and a second audience vote on the motion. But before I call on our debaters for their opening statements, let's find out how the 2,700 people in this audience voted as they came into the hall. We're going to get those numbers up on the screen now. 22% of you in favor of the motion, 57 opposed, and fully 21% of you undecided. Now, we also, as you know, asked you a second question tonight. We asked you, depending on what you hear during the debate, are you open to changing your vote? Let's have those numbers too, please. Wow. 75% of this audience, three quarters, could change their vote depending what they hear in the next hour and a half. Ladies and gentlemen, we clearly have a debate on our hands. And remember, we will poll the audience again at the end of our proceedings to find out which of these two debaters was able to win by swaying us with the power of their arguments. Well, the time has come for introductory remarks. Christopher Hitchens, as we've agreed, you will begin first with your opening statement. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much to the Monk family, great philanthropists, for making this possible. Seven minutes, ladies and gentlemen, for the foundational argument between religion and philosophy it leaves me hardly time to praise my distinguished opponent. In fact, I might have to seize a later chance of doing that. <laughs> um, I think three and a half minutes for metaphysics and three and a half for the material world won't be excessive. And I have a text. And I have a text, and it is from, because I won't take a religious text from 
a known extremist or fanatic. It's from Cardinal Newman. Uh, recently, Prime Minister Blair's in, uh, urging uh, beatified and on his way to canonization, a man whose apologia uh, made many Anglicans reconsider their fealty and made many people join the Roman Catholic Church and is considered, I think rightly, a, a great Christian thinker. My text from the apologia. The Catholic Church, said, uh, said Newman, holds it better for the sun and moon to drop from heaven, for the earth to fail, and for all the many millions on it to die in extremest agony than that one soul, I will not say will be lost, but should commit one venial sin, should tell one willful untruth, or should steal one farthing without excuse. You'll have to say it's beautifully phrased, ladies and gentlemen, but to me, and here's my proposition, what we have here, and picked from no mean source, is a distillation of precisely what is twisted and immoral in the faith mentality. It's essential fanaticism, it's consideration of the human being as raw material, and it's fantasy of purity. Once you assume a creator and a plan, it makes us objects in a cruel experiment whereby we are created sick and commanded to be well. I'll repeat that. Created sick and then ordered to be well. And over us to supervise this is installed a celestial dictatorship, a kind of divine North Korea, <laughs> greedy, exigent, exigent, I would say more than exigent, greedy for uncritical praise from dawn till dusk, and swift to punish the original sins with which it so tenderly gifted us in the very first place. <laughs> However, let, 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 let no one say there's no cure. Salvation is offered. Redemption, indeed, is promised at the low price of the surrender of your critical faculties. <laughs> Religion, it might be said, uh, must be said, uh, would have to admit, makes extraordinary claims, but though I would maintain that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, rather daringly provides not even ordinary evidence for its extraordinary supernatural claims. Therefore, we might begin by asking, and I'm asking my opponent as well as you when you consider your voting, is it good for the world to appeal to our credulity and not to our skepticism? Is it good for the world to worship a deity that takes sides in wars and human affairs? To appeal to our fear and to our guilt, is it good for the world? To our terror our terror of death, is it good to appeal? To preach guilt and shame about the sexual act and the sexual relationship, is this good for the world? And asking yourself the while, are these really religious responsibilities, as I maintain they are? To terrify children with the image of hell and eternal punishment, not just of themselves, but of their parents and those they love. Perhaps worst of all, to consider women an inferior creation, is that good? for the world. And can you name me a religion that has not done that? To insist that we are created and not evolved in the face of all the evidence. To say that certain books of legend and myth, man-made and primitive, are revealed, not man-made code. Religion forces nice people to do unkind things and also makes intelligent people say stupid things. Handed a small baby for the first time, is it your first reaction to think, beautiful, almost perfect. Now please hand me the sharp stone for its genitalia that I may do the work of the Lord. No. <laughs> it is, uh, as, the great, um, as the great physicist Stephen Weinberg has very aptly put it, in the ordinary moral universe, the good will do the best they can, the worst will do the worst they can. But if you want to make good people do wicked things, you'll need religion. <laughs> now, I've got now one minute and 57 seconds to say why I think this is very self-evident in our material world. Let me ask Tony again, because he's here, um, and because the, the place where he is tr seeking peace is the birthplace of monotheism. So you might think it was unusually filled with refulgence and love and peace. Everyone in the uh, civilized world has roughly agreed, including the majority of Arabs and Jews and the international community, that there should be 
enough room for two states, for two peoples in the same land. I think we have a rough agreement on that. Why can't we get it? The UN can't get it. The US can't get it. The Quartet can't get it. The PLO can't get it. The Israeli Parliament can't get it. Why can't they get it? Because the parties of God have a veto on it, and everybody knows that this is true. Because of the divine promises made about this territory, there will never be peace, there will never be compromise, there will instead be misery, shame, and tyranny, and people will kill each other's children for ancient books and caves and relics. And who is going to say that this is good for the world? And that's just the, argument, the example nearest to hand. Have you looked lately at the possibility that we used to discuss as children in fear what will happen when, when messianic fanatics get hold of an apocalyptic weapon? Well, we're about to find that out as we watch the Islamic Republic of Iran and its party of God allies uh, make a dress rehearsal for precisely this. Have you looked lately at the revival of Tsarism in Putin's Russia where the black cowled, black coated leadership of Russian Orthodoxy is draped over an increasingly xenophobic, tyrannical, expansionist and aggressive uh, regime. Have you looked lately at the teaching in Africa and the consequences of it of a church that says AIDS may be wicked but not as wicked as condoms? That's exactly no seconds left ladies and gentlemen. I've done my best Believe me, I have more. Um, <laughs> well, Christopher, thank you for starting our debate. Mr. Blair, your opening remarks, please. Thank you. First of all, let me say it's a, a real pleasure uh, to be with you all this evening, to be back in Toronto. It's a particular privilege and honor to be uh, with Christopher in this debate. Um, let me first of all say that I do not regard the leader of North Korea as a religious icon. Uh, you will be delighted, delighted to know. Um, I'm going to make, um, it's a biblical number, seven, but I'm going to make seven points in my seven minutes. The first is this. It is undoubtedly true that people commit horrific acts of evil in the name of religion. It is also undoubtedly true that people do acts of extraordinary common good inspired by religion. Almost half of healthcare in Africa is delivered by faith-based organizations, saving millions of lives. A quarter of worldwide HIV AIDS care is provided by Catholic organizations. There is the fantastic work of Muslim and Jewish relief organizations. There are in Canada thousands of religious organizations that care for the mentally ill or disabled or disadvantaged or destitute. And here in Toronto, barely one and a half miles from here, is a shelter run by Covenant House, a Christian charity for homeless youth in Canada. So the proposition that religion is unadulterated poison is unsustainable. It can be destructive. It can also create a deep well of compassion and frequently does. And the second is that people are inspired to do such good by what I would say is the true essence of faith, which is along with doctrine and ritual particular to each faith, a basic belief common to all faiths in serving and loving God through serving and loving your fellow human beings. As witnessed by the life and teaching of Jesus, one of love, selflessness and sacrifice, the meaning of the Torah. It was Rabbi Hillel who was once famously challenged by someone who said they would convert to religion if he could recite the whole of the Torah standing on one leg. He stood on one leg and said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That is the Torah, the rest is commentary, now go and do it. <laughs> the teaching of Prophet Muhammad, saving one life it is as if you're saving the whole of humanity. The Hindu searching after selflessness. The Buddhist concepts of karuna, mudita, metta, which all subjugate selfish desires to care for others, see consistence specifically on respect for others of another faith. That, in my view, is the true face of faith. And the values derived from this essence offer to many people a benign, positive and progressive framework by which to live our daily lives.